Hey guys, thanks for joining me for an episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Too Many Bones. This is a newer game by Chip Theory Games. It is a one to four player cooperative game, so all the players are working together to defeat the tyrant, and it's a two to six hour game, depending upon the tyrant you've chosen to play against. So in the game itself, the players are going to be playing a race of Gearlocks, which is a very small kind of, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, they're kind of like gnomes. They're very good with technology, uh, a little bit like goblins in that they're very small little people. And so for one reason or not, they've, they've come out of their little reclusive hidings and the tyrants in the north have, de have decided to start trying to take over the lands. And I guess the rest of the races have decided they don't really want to mess around and so the Gearlocks have stepped up and they have sent their little teams of adventurers out to try to stop these, these tyrants in their tracks. So that's where you come in as a player. You're going to choose one of the Gearlocks, which each one is very unique. This game, each different player is very unique. Uh, they all have their own separate dice and the way that they function and their roles within the group. So each time you play one of these guys, it's going to take you a couple times to really get the hang of, of how to play this particular Gearlock. And then from there, the players are going to progress by going on endeavors each day or each round that consists of a day. And each day you're going to resolve an encounter card and, and whether combat or not and progress through there. And it, it, each of those cards, if you're successful, will usually grant you progress points. Once you have enough progress points based on the tyrant you're facing, then you'll have the option to fight the tyrant. And as long as you can defeat the tyrant by the time the allotted time that's given to you, then you will defeat him and be the overall winner of that particular tyrant or game round. So my opinions of this game so far are really good. First off, let's go ahead and start with the positives. Production. This game is amazing. They really, really did set the bar very high. There's so many companies out there in the industry that are big and put out their pretty much their benchmark and what you would expect a high quality game to be. Chip Theory Games said, let's just push it past that. Every aspect of this game has been polished and used the highest quality components. You have tons of dice that are included in this game that are all screen printed, high quality. They will not rub off, you know, break down dice. You have each of the player boards that the players will play on are neoprene mats, which is usually an upgrade for most games. They are in this game included in the box. All the different enemies and 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 chips and all that are high quality chips plastic heavy grade chips that definitely have some really nice weight to them when you're playing and moving things around so every aspect of this game even the board the box itself is a very high grade cardboard box there's art on the inside everything has been just every last detail they can think of has been done from there each of the Gearlocks, the other thing I really like is the way the Gearlocks play. Every one of them is very unique and different. Each one of them has their own play style and focus within the group. You have uh, Patches, who is a healer, and his focus is on healing and helping the party in that regard. You have Boomer, who is all about generating and making bombs. So she's gathering components and using her skills to fashion all these different bombs that she'll be able to get throughout the game. And so she's very weak and fragile, but she she can be very powerful uh, as a damage dealer. So each one of them, like I said, plays very differently. And I really enjoy that part because it, it does take a while to learn how to play your gear lock. This is a very challenging game. So when you choose a gear lock, make sure you stick with it for a couple of games to really get the full effect because it's going to take you a little while to figure out how to play each one. And then the game itself. I love uh, cooperative games. I really enjoy working together with other players to go up against the board and and really test your mantle to see if, if you can prevail against the tyrants that they're going to throw at you. And this one definitely makes you work for it. Uh, it's a very hard, challenging game. And so it, it definitely is rewarding as you're working together with the team and you do need to work together as a team, make decisions together, uh, help each other as you guys are upgrading your different gear locks to really specialize and help your party out as a whole. Uh, if you don't work together, this one definitely will, will take care of you pretty quick. So as that is the positives, let's go ahead and talk about some of the negatives. And again, these are my opinions. Uh, so yours might be a little bit different in this. So first off, this is a hard game, and it's going to take you a while to figure it out. There's a lot of rules to this one, and the learning curve is pretty steep. Each one of the gear locks, like I said, does play very differently, which is a good thing, but it also can be hard to teach then because 
I might be familiar with Boomer or Patches, but my, I might not be able to be familiar with some of the other uh, gear locks that players have chosen. And if I'm trying to teach the game, that's going to be a hurdle to try to get over. So like I said, this is one that it's going to take you some time. This is not one to sit down and start you know, as a group to try to read through the rules as you're playing. It's not going to work. You're going to need to learn this one on your own or hopefully by this video and uh, progress through it that way. The other thing is the rule book. I would like to see them uh, do more focus on, on the rules. There's a lot of areas that I'm not quite sure on the way that they're, they're worded and there's some ambiguity to it. Um, I know this is the first revision to the rule book, so they're very on top of things, which is really good to see. Uh, they've put out a whole nother rule book already and it did fix some things, but there's still some clarifications on some things that I would like to see. So hopefully they're going to continue progressing with that. I know that they just did another Kickstarter for another version of this. So hopefully they'll be able to clarify some more of those within that rule book as well. We'll find out. But so just stuff like that. Like I said, these are overall, these are small issues to a very, very good game. This is one that I would highly recommend checking out, especially if you're into these kind of games, if you like role-playing games, if you like dice building games, or if you just like dice games in general, uh, this is definitely one that's going to hit that mark. And it has a lot of depth to it, like I said. This is a strong learning curve, but on the reward side to that, as that learning curve will help you as you progress through the game and really give you that sense of accomplishment that once you've really locked down your, your gear lock and, and learn how to play them. So again, these are just my opinions. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts as well. Leave them in the comment section below or jump on Facebook and Twitter. Hit me up there. I'd love to, to start some conversations with you guys. Uh, if you like this game, if you didn't like this game, what's your favorite gear lock? All those different things. I'd love to hear your guys' comments and suggestions in the boxes below. Let me know what you guys are playing, if there's other games you want me to cover. Other than that, let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll teach you guys how to play. The first sets of dice we're going to take a look at are the common dice. So we have status effect dice that are going to have different statuses on them, such as poison, stun, terror, and so on. And each one of these dice is going to have six different sides. And you will be able to find all of these symbols and what they do on the Gearlock Adventuring Reference Guide. Then we have our two combat sets of dice. We have our attack dice that are going to have four one sword symbols on them, one two sword symbol, and a set of bones. And then the defense dice, which are going to have three shield symbols on them, one two shield, and two sets of bones. There are four different types of encounters that are included in the game, and you will use some of these encounters during each game. So the first are the special encounters, which there are six of those. Then we have the base or general encounters, which you'll be using in the game. And these there will be 30 different ones of these. If you're playing a solo game, which means you're only playing with one gear lock and you're playing by yourself, you can use the solo set and these will replace the general set. And there are 12 of these included in the game as well. And then you will also have the tyrant encounter cards, which we've kind of already covered. From here on the each encounter is going to give a little bit of a backstory to set the mood and in the bottom of the encounter will be the type of, of encounter card that it is and the number from that set. On the back of each encounter most of them will give you a choice of different options to do and the players will collectively look at these and choose one of them that they want to go after. Each of these types is going to list different icons on the side which you can find all of these icons, as you can see on this chart here, on the Gearlock Adventuring Reference Guide. So each of these choices will give different rewards if it is accomplished. And so, for example, with this one, you would simply just do its effects. And this is not a non-combat choice. And then you have a combat choice, which is going to list its own set of rewards if the players are able to complete it and the different effects of that combat and different things. So this one will show you a number of baddie cues that you'll have or baddie points that you'll add up based on the effects there. And then at the bottom of each card is going to be the number of progress points that it is worth and any additional rewards that that card will have upon completion. So in order to create a encounter deck, 
First off, we're not playing a solo mission, so we can get rid of the solo card. And this is the only Tyrant uh, encounter card that we're going to be using in this game, as it is the only one that is included in for our Tyrant. Then we are going to go ahead and grab the special uh, encounter cards of one through three which again are numbered at the bottom of each card. So we're going to use these three in the game. And then based on the Tyrant's card himself, we're going to go ahead and grab a number of general cards from the base set. And you're going to go ahead and shuffle up the full deck of these cards and then take a number of them equal to our, pro our, our number of rounds minus three. So we're going to grab five of these cards. We'll shuffle up this deck and take five from it. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. Then we're gonna shuffle these five up with the Tyrant card. And then finally, we're going to place the special encounters one through three on top of that deck. And this will, this will create our encounter deck for our game against this tyrant. There are two different loot decks in the game. The first is your basic loot, and each of these cards is going to have the name of the item on the top of the card, whether it is a permanent item, a multi-use, or single-use item, the image of the item, and the details of the item and how it works for your gear lock. Then we have trove loot, which are normally going to be much more powerful items. Each of these cards is going to have the name of the item on the top, Again, if it is a permanent, single, or multi-use item, the image of the item and how it is going to work. With these, unlike regular loot cards, these drove loot cards must be unlocked and unlock all three of the different locks that are on them before they can be used. And these locks must be unlocked in order, starting with the lever, then the trip, and finally the force. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. In order to do this, you're going to need your three lockpicking action dice, and your intuition dice. Each turn you will roll these four dice and then resolve the intuition dice first before you do any of the other dice. The intuition dice is going to have three different symbols on it. You're going to have the plus one which will add plus one result to one of the dice. You're going to have a re-roll which allows you to re-roll one of your dice and the convert which allows you to convert one of your dice from one symbol to the other. And each of these dice is going to have different symbols on it and numbers. So for this one, this is a two of lever, two of trip, and one of force. And like I said, these dice will have different values on them. So you must have one or more dice with the value equal to or higher than in order to unlock the lock. So let's take a look at that. So the first one we're going after is the lever. So this, we have our intuition dice that'll add plus one to one of the results. Unfortunately, we have two trips and one force dice that came up. So when this happens, the first time in a turn, you're allowed to reroll all your dice one time when trying to resolve the first lock of that turn. So let's go again. So now we have a plus one again, and let's go ahead and say, for example, that we had a lever of three. So with this one, this allows us to add one to the lever, which would bump it up to a four, and that would be able to satisfy that first lock. Now any dice that are used besides the intuition dice are going to be locked on the side unless the intuition dice comes up with the plus one, which will allow you to not exhaust the action dice that you're using. So at that point, then we would move on to the next lock, which is the trip, so we're gonna roll all our dice again. And this one allows us to re-roll one of our dice with the intuition dice. So let's go ahead and roll this one. All right, so that lets us convert one of the dice to the value of the dice or the uh, type of lock that we're needing. So with this one, we can convert this to a three of trip instead of a three of force. So that would bump us up to five, which would allow us to unlock the trip value. So at that point, any dice that we've used now are going to main, remain exhausted and you can just move them off to the side. And any dice you have remaining plus the intuition dice can be re-rolled to unlock the next lock. All right, so then we have the intuition dice coming with a re-roll. And this lets us convert, but unfortunately even converting to a force of three would not be enough. 
So at this point, we could not complete that last lock. So any locks that we've unlocked during our turn will remain unlocked for all future turns. And other players can also work on our uh, locks as well. So the next player could go and potentially unlock that item for us. There are four different baddies included in the game. We have tyrants, which I'm going to cover in just a minute. Then we have one point baddies, five point baddies, and 20 point baddies. And on the other side of each of these tokens is going to be the image and description of each baddie. So we're going to go through this and show you what all the different values mean. So in the top corner here, we have the number of hit points that each baddie will have. Then we have the baddie's starting initiative value and the combat type that that baddie is. So this one is a melee baddie. And then we also have ranged baddies. Then we have the creature type that that baddie is. And these will come into play when choosing the tyrant. He will outline which baddies are going to be included with him. And I will show that during the baddie or the tyrant setup. Then we have each baddie has a defensive value or number of defensive dice that they will roll minus the number of defensive dice that they already have active on their token. So if you already have one defensive dice on our uh, troll here, he would not roll a defensive dice. It's only when he doesn't have any on there already. And it'll be the number of dice minus this value. So if the dragon here has one defensive dice, he would still roll one defensive dice. Then each baddie is also going to have an attack value, which is the number of attack dice that they will roll. And they're only going to roll these if they have a target that they can actually target with the attack dice. The defensive dice are always going to be rolled, even if they don't have a target for attacking. Then we have the baddie skills, which are going to be in black lettering. And these are always going to be in effect, and you'll be able to find what these skills are on the, on the uh, Gearlock ref Adventuring Reference Guide. Then we have the baddies' backup plan, if they're able to do any, which is if they roll any bone symbols when rolling their attack and defense dice, they will trigger this effect, which is usually outlined in purple. From here, then, we have its targeting, which each baddie is going to have a priority targeting. So melee uh, baddies are always going to target the closest model. If it is tied, then it will move into its targeting, which it will show a picture of a target. And there are two different images. We have the strongest or highest hit points uh, gear lock. And then we also have the weakest uh, or lowest number hit point gear lock. And some, enemy, or some baddies will even be able to target multiple gear locks which will show images of more than one of these symbols on there. From here, then we have diagonal movement, which some of the high-level baddies will have a picture of feet on there, which means that they can move diagonally on the combat mat, which I'll show you guys in a minute. And then some baddies are also going to have an image or multiple images for extra baddies. When this baddie comes out on the battle mat, it will place a number of additional five point baddies in the battle queue which we'll cover as well. The last baddie type we need to talk about are the tyrants. So for this part I'm also going to show how setup works. So each tyrant is going to have its own card which is going to list the name of the tyrant on the top, a little bit of a backstory about that tyrant, and two icons on the side. The first is the number of progress points you must accumulate in order to challenge the tyrant. And the second is the number of rounds you will have in order to defeat the tyrants. If you can't defeat them within that number of rounds, then the game is over and the players will lose. At the bottom is the game length of each tyrant if you're challenging them. So uh, Numb here is going to be the shortest game that you can play. And then each tyrant will also list a number of icons on the side here, which are the different enemy types that are included when creating the enemy type stacks for the 1, 5, and 20 point baddies. Finally, on the back of each Tyrant card is going to be all the different effects of that Tyrant and the effects of their dice that they will have, which each Tyrant has their own specific dice that is special for them. And it also outlines any skills that they have as well, or any other effects. So from here, when setting up, each Tyrant will have their own card. 
and a token to go along with it, which Tyrant tokens are always going to have the image of the Tyrant on the back, as well as they're going to be color-coded as well for each Tyrant. So our Num Tyrant has got a red background, which will also receive the red dice, and each Tyrant is also going to have a number of Tyrant event uh, encounter cards, which each of these will be numbered at the bottom as well. So some Tyrants will have multiple cards, where other ones will only have one. Finally, like I said, each tyrant will also have the three different enemy types on the bottom. So each enemy or each you're going to go through the stack of of uh, one, five and 20 point baddies and uh, collect all of the baddies with elite the symbols for him on there and create those into stacks and go ahead and shuffle those stacks up into their individual stacks of one, five and 20 point baddies. So each gear lock is fairly involved, so I'm going to take you guys through all the different stuff that a gear lock has. So first off, each gear lock is going to get their own reference guide. On one side, it's going to tell you what all the different backup plans that that gear lock has, some basic information about the gear lock and his role in the party, any a beginner's building section where if you're not familiar with this gear lock, it kind of outlines some of the different areas you might want to focus on initially. It also gives his innate and his innate plus one abilities and any effect dice definitions that you might need. On the other side of the card, it's going to give a breakdown of the difficulty for both cooperative and solo for playing this character, a full breakdown of all the different dice symbols that you'll find on all of his different skill dice. You'll also have a legend to give you what each of the abbreviations means and a full breakdown of what each of the symbols is going to do on these different dice. As well as, in parentheses, it's also going to give you the code, which again will be found down in this legend, of where that dice is, where it goes when you use it, and how it is used. The one other thing you want to check is down the side here, some of these in some of the gear locks might have a circle around them, which means that those dice will start the beginning of the game in the gear locks board already. So, for example, the other gear lock we're going to be using today is Boomer. So with Boomer, she is actually going to start with her four starting dice, or her four scavenger dice on her player mat, as you guys will see. So these will all start, and you can place them all on either the bone symbol or for the boom counter on the zero symbol, or the blank side, as she won't actually start the game with any of these in play, or uh, having any of these. And we'll take a look at that later. Moving over to the main board for the gear lock, each gear lock has a section that has their four main stats, which is health, dexterity, attack, and defense. This area is also going to outline their, their different innate abilities. So initially, Pickett here is going to start with shield wall, and then when he upgrades to innate plus one, it's the gear lock wall. And both of those are found on the back of his reference sheet. As well as in the top here, it's going to give his different um, professions that he can go through and gain skill dice in, which are found over here. So each of these stats, health, dexterity, attack, and defense, shows a number next to it, and this is their starting ability for that area. For health and all these, you're going to use stat dice to increase them, so as you get more health, you'll add the dice in there based on the value, and it'll be whatever the starting stat is plus the dice It is your total. So 5 plus 2 is 7 health. And the same goes for dexterity, attack, and defense. Now, a couple things. When you get training points that you can use to upgrade these stats, there's a couple of ways that they work. So first off, for each training point you spend, you can try to upgrade one of your skills, and both the attack and defense are going to require a special roll to see if you can qualify for that. For health, it's simply just adding in the dice with whatever number it is for each point that you spent. And the same for dexterity. For each point you spend, you'll just add a dice with or change the dice to the number that you need. For attack, you must roll a number of attack dice equal to your base stat plus whatever the stat dice is there currently. So for example, with this one, you would roll two attack dice. And if you, roll, if you don't roll any bones symbols on those attack dice, then you've passed the test and you can spend one point to increase that stat. For defense, it works basically the same way. You're going to roll defensive dice and you'll have two shots at it. So since I rolled a bone here, I can roll again. 
And as long as you don't roll any bones, you can increase that symbol by one again. Now, one important factor there is that a skill point is never lost. So if you fail your attempt to attack, you can try to do it in defense or simply move it over to health or dexterity. So you never lose any points. All right, so moving on. At the other side here, we have slots for your active dice and your locked dice. And again, some of these skill dice, when you use them, will go into your locked slots, which are, again, outlines on the legend next to each of the skills is a symbol. Then we have your backup plan. So as you roll bones symbols, you're going to place them in the backup plan. And one time per turn, you can spend a number of bones to activate one of the backup plans. And again, that's outlined on the back of your sheet on what each of those different backup plans does. On the side here is where you'll store your exhausted dice during the game, which normally skill dice are one time per combat, and then you move them over to the exhausted side, unless the skill specifically says otherwise, or you have items that can bring them back into play. Every once in a while, you'll also have your attack or defense dice come over here, which will count against you, and I'll show you that more later on. But normally, you will not lock or exhaust any of your attack or defense dice. Finally, we have the professions section, which will have skill dice that are associated with them. Each player will have a collection of skill dice that they'll have at the beginning of the game. And these dice will stay off to the side until you purchase them. These are upgrades to your character that you can use to gain training points, or when you get training points, you can spend them on these different dice. Now, you can specialize in any profession you want to, and you can move around. You do not have to complete one profession before gaining skills in another. The one exception to this is each profession is going to have some star areas, which means that in order to start getting other uh, dice in those professions, you must purchase the star areas first. So, for example, if we look at his captain, uh, profession, he must purchase the stand ground dice first, which there's a number in the top corner, and that corresponds to the stat dice of that type. So if I bought uh, stand ground, that is the number one dice, and I'll just place it in there. When it comes time for me to use it, then I would roll that dice with any other dice I choose. From here, if I have another point to spend, I can choose to move down in the direction of the arrows. So I could not purchase a uh, lockdown yet because I have not purchased one of these other skills. So I can purchase either one of those. But again, like I said, you can move around. So once I purchase this one, I could say move over to his uh, warden abilities. And then I can purchase one of those. And each one of them has a star. So I can purchase those in any order I choose. Or I could move over here and purchase one of these. But I have to purchase the one that's with the star. The one exception to this are the consumable dice. Those dice you cannot purchase with skill points. Those you'll have to acquire either from your backup plan or some of your equipment cards will allow you to have those as well. Over here is a loot slot so you can store your loot cards or your trove loot cards over there as well. You can store a maximum of four cards unless one of the cards is heavy, which heavy cards will count as three slots. Finally, for final setup, you're also going to have your initiative dice. You'll have a chip token with your character's picture on it. And there's two sides to this. You have the side without stars, which is your innate side. And when you unlock your innate plus one, then you'll flip it over to the side with all the little stars around it. From there, also on the, at the beginning of the game, you're going to get a number of health tokens equal to your health. So we're going to have five for Picket. And that is the setup for the character. So for setup, the first thing you're going to do is lay out the battle mat in the center of the board. And then obviously you want to spread things out a little bit more, but I wanted to get everything on camera here so you guys can see it. But each player will have their gear lock, all their dice, and all the stuff that we've already talked about for setup. Then you can also place out the day counter with the number one uh, token on there. Have your uh, tyrant that you're going after, the loot and trove loot. You can go ahead and shuffle up both of those decks and place them out couple stacks of, of health points, and your level 1 are your 1-point one baddies, 5-point baddies, and 20-point baddies. Each of those is separated based on the tyrant you're using again, and you can go ahead and shuffle those up as well. Place out your 4 
tokens for your uh, battle mat and the initiative dice that go along with those. And you guys will see how those will work in a minute. Now there's a couple things that I have off screen. Again, of course, is the encounter deck that I've already showed you guys how to make. So you'll place that on the field. And then I also have a tray of all the dice that I'm going to be using, which of course they provided a really nice black tray that holds everything as well. But for this video, I'm just doing some basic stuff. So you have your defensive dice, your attacking dice, the lock picking dice, your standard D6, and all the, uh, the uh, different effect dice. So those will be kept off screen as well. And I'm going to be doing all my rolls in one of the Chip Theory Games uh, dice trays that they have. And these are really cool. I really enjoy these, not just for this game, for any game that has dice. As when you're done using them, they pop apart and they can lay flat. And then you can just pop them back together whenever you need them. And they're really handy. So I would definitely recommend some of those if you guys have a lot of dice games, as they do make a big difference. ready to start the game now. So each game round is going to be broken down into four phases. The New Day, Encounter, Reward, and Recovery phase. We're going to go ahead and take a look at each one of these. And you can find a really nice guide for this on the Gearlock Adventuring Reference Guide in the bottom corner as you guys can see on the screen. So we're going to go ahead and start with the first phase which is the New Day phase. We're going to rotate the Day Counter one day. So on the first day, you're obviously not going to do that, so we're, we have it set to 1. Then we're going to move on to the encounter phase. We're going to go ahead and draw and read an encounter card. From there, we're going to pick a choice and attempt to successfully complete it. If successful, we'll move on to the reward phase. Otherwise, you're going to go ahead and skip and move to the recovery phase. So I'm not going to read through this as, as that's part of the fun, and I want you guys to experience that for yourselves the first time. So we're going to jump right to the back of the card. And we have a couple of choices. Now you can choose either combat choices or non-combat choices based on the card. And there is a legend that you'll also find on that reference guide that I talked about, as you guys can see. And then you can talk amongst the other players, make your decision, and, and go with whichever one you want. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the top choice, which is going to give me two training points per gear lock. So that'll help boost them up a little bit. So at this point, we've made our selection, so we're ready to move on to, since this is a non-combat choice, we're ready to move on to the reward phase, where we're going to gain rewards. So if the rewards grant loot or trove loot, you're going to go ahead and draw those now. And if the re reward includes training points, you're going to go ahead and use those now as well. So as we have two training points to spend, we're going to go ahead and move over to doing that. So Picket is the first one I'm going to go ahead and resolve. He is our defensive character. He needs to be uh, as tanky as we can make him. So he's going to, we're going to go ahead and give him one additional health point. So we're going to go ahead and add another health token to him. And then he needs to, we need to bump up his dexterity so that he can roll more dice. And I'm going to cover this a little bit more in combat. But basically your total dexterity is the maximum number of dice you can throw each round of combat. Which will include your attack dice, your defense dice, and any skill dice you choose to use up to the maximum number of dexterity that you have. So dexterity is pretty important. From here, let's go ahead and go over to Boomer. We're going to go ahead and spend her points. So again, Boomer is very fragile at three health. So let's go ahead and give her a health point. And so we'll add a health token to her. And then she needs to be a little bit more of our attacky character since we have Pickett to be defensive. So we're going to go ahead and try to give her another uh, attack dice. So we're going to go ahead and give this a roll. We're good. We didn't roll any bones. So we're going to go ahead and be able to upgrade our, uh, increase her attack by one. Okay, so then we're going to move on to the final phase, which is the recovery phase. During this phase, you can trade loot with party members. You can make a lockpicking attempt on yours or another player's trove loot. And then from there, then each gear lock will have one choice between three different options that they can do for themselves. The first is to rest and recover, where they're going to heal up to their maximum health. The second option is to search for better loot, where they're going to discard one of their loot cards. Then they will roll six attack dice, and for each set of bones that they roll, they can reveal a loot card, and out of those loot cards, they can choose one of those to keep. The last option is to scout the area, where they're going to roll that d6 dice, and based on the result they roll, they're going to reveal a baddie. So if they roll a 1 through 3, they're going to reveal a 1-point baddie. 
If they like him, then they can go ahead and put him back on top of the deck or the stack face up. Or if they don't want to face him, then they can go ahead and put him on the bottom of the stack. Now, if they roll a four or five, then they'll get to do a five point. And if they roll a six, then they'll be able to do a 20 point baddie. From there, then you're ready to start all over at the top of the round. So we're going to go ahead and move it to day two. Then again, we're going to draw a uh, effect card or a uh, event card. And again, I'm not going to read this, so we're going to write to the back. And so this one has two different options for combat. So with this one, we're, we have two options. We're either going to get help from the guards, where they're going to help us do damage to the baddies each round, or we can be a little bit more risky, not get the guards' help, and we'll get some extra rewards for, for not getting their help. But there's one thing I want you to keep in mind with this game. This is a very hard game, so if this is your first time uh, with these gear locks you're playing, uh, I would recommend getting help wherever you can. This is until you learn how to play your gear lock to its fullest, it's going to be a very challenging game for you. So don't feel bad about seeking help or starting off at, with uh, some of the different difficulties that they have uh, to help you out because um, otherwise you're going to get beat down pretty quick. So in order to do a combat now, we're going to go ahead and set up our, our baddie uh, uh, queue. In order to do that, we're going to take the day that it is, so this is day two, times the number of gear locks. So we're playing two. So that is a total of four points of baddies that we're going to receive. And you're going to take the highest point baddie you possibly can as many times as you can until you get to your, your points value. So, for example, if we were playing with three gear locks, we would have six points of baddies instead. So we must take a five point baddie at that point and then one one point baddie. We could not choose to take six one point baddies. It has to be the highest value baddie uh, as many times as you can. And then you fill it in with the other ones as you need to. And from there, then you're going to stack starting with the highest baddies that you have down. So if we had a one point or a five point and a one point, the one point would go on the bottom and the five point would go on top. And then we would go into in resolving how those are going to be deployed. So again, like I said, we're playing with uh, four one point baddies. So we'll take a set of four baddies and stack them up. And then we're ready to move into setting up the battle mat and that. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So first off, let's go ahead and talk about the combat board. Over here on the side, we have the initiative meter. So this is going to have the round dice that you have placed in there at the number one slot at the beginning of combat. And it's also going to hold all of the baddie and gear lock initiative dice and will tell you when each of them is going to activate. Then we also have a number of slots on the board that have different images in them. We have ranged images and melee images. And we also have two rows of different colors and these are going to be the rows that the baddies will start in. One baddie in each of these colors. And then the grade areas are where our gear locks are going to start. And they will get to choose based on if they are melee or ranged. And they can place them in any of these selections based on their symbols. So let's go ahead and start. We already have our queue uh, set up. So we have four level one baddies. And so what we're going to do is we're going to flip over each baddie. And he's going to correspond to each row. So our first baddie will be the level or the row for one. He is a melee baddie and his health is three. So we'll have three health tokens and we'll put him in the melee section. And his initiative is one. So we'll set the blue dice to one. Then we'll move on to the next one. We have a dragon hatchling. He is a ranged baddie and he has three health. He is the... A second one to go so he'll be in the purple section and so he'll be placed in the range spots and his initiative is six all right next guy we have is a orc scout he is going to be in yellow he has three health and he is also a ranged guy so he'll go in the back in the range section our final baddie is a troll, so he will go into the, in the section four. He also has three health, and his initiative is two. Oop, forgot to put this one out too. So level three is a four, and our guy over here is a two, so we'll set that. Okay, so now we have our four baddies out, and if we had any more baddies in the queue at this point, they would come out in subsequent turns, and they would take up the slots 
that are open to them. So if, say for example, this guy here died, even though he's in the fourth slot, his spot would open up, and so we would be bringing a new baddie out if there was one into his slot. So let's go into the gear lock setup now. So we have two gear locks. We have Picket and Boomer. So Picket is a melee gear lock, so he can go into one of the four melee sections. So let's go ahead and put him here. Then we're going to go ahead and set Boomer up. She is a ranged uh, gear lock, so we're going to put her over here. She can help, or she can uh, stay behind Picket a little bit and get a little bit of defense in that way. From there, then we're going to go ahead and roll the two initiative dice for our gear locks. And so we have a six and a three. So our peer, uh, our gear lock will always go before uh, enemies that she's tied with. And then Picket's going to slide in between these two here. Now that brings up a good point. If, say for example, two baddies had the same initiative, the baddie that would go first is the one that's higher or lower on the uh, track as far as which slot they're in. So a number one, if a number one and number three are tied, the number one is going to be higher on the track than the number three is, even though they have the same initiative. So before we head into combat, there's a couple other things I want to cover. First is the initiative track. Each round, each player and enemy is going to get to activate based on the initiative. At the end of the rounds, you will turn the round marker to the next round, and this is going to continue until you reach round six, which round six in every subsequent round, if you're still playing, is a fatigue round, which basically means that all enemies and characters will take one point of damage that cannot be negated by any means. And that will continue until the game, the uh, either the players are defeated or all the enemies are defeated. So the last thing is, before heading into combat, you want to check to make sure that none of the gear locks or enemies have any special effects that they need to handle. So we just happen to have Picket, who has a, a uh, his innate ability, Shield Wall, which will trigger before combat starts. So in, the Shield Wall says that at the start of the battle... Picket may roll all of his defense dice, which are the white dice only, and place roll defense in his active slots for this roll. Bones cannot be placed in the back of the plan. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll roll his two defensive dice. So he rolls a one and a two. Now, if he would have rolled two ones, he could not combine these dice to make a two. He must keep the dice separate. And if he would have rolled any bones symbols, then he would have just discarded those dice for this roll. From here, we're ready to move into combat. So, starting with round one, our first character to go is going to be uh, Boomer. So, with Boomer, she, at the beginning of her turn, she's going to have to resolve any effect dice that are on her uh, chip. Which, right now, she doesn't. Which effects dice would be the black dice that have any effects uh, like poison or whatnot. Now, the one other thing is that she can use any of her loot cards, which can be done even before resolving the effects of, of any dice that are on her character. But other than that, she can use loot any time during the turn, uh, or, or any time during her turn. From here, then, she can spend her dexterity to move around the board if she wants to. Each point of dexterity she spends can let her move to one adjacent space, which adjacency is always done in orthogonal directions. There is no diagonal movement allowed. From there, then she's going to go ahead and choose her target if she's going to make an attack, which Boomer is a ranged gear lock, so she can target any enemy on the board. She does not have to have line of sight, and she doesn't need to be adjacent to them. She can target anybody that she wants to on the board. From there, then she's going to go ahead and gather up her dice. This is where dexterity comes into play. Dexterity, the your number of dexterity minus any that you spent for movement, will be the number of dice that you can roll during your turn, or the maximum number of dice. So she's going to be able to roll three dice of any combination of her choice based on her different stats. So she can roll up to two attack dice, up to two defense dice, or any of the skill dice that she chooses. So right now she has a total of eight different dice that she can choose from. Out of those eight, she can roll a maximum of three of them. So she's going to go ahead and roll two attack dice, and let's go ahead and roll one defensive dice so that we can get a little bit of defense going. 
So she's going to go ahead and give those a roll, and she's going to choose her target. So let's go after the uh, dragon. Let's go ahead and target the little dragon hatchling. All right, so she rolls really well. She got a two for her defense, and she happened to roll three hits. Now, the dragon does not have any defense, so it's going to take the full brunt of the damage. So it takes three damage, which is all of its health, so it will be eliminated. We can go ahead and remove its initiative dice and its health tokens. Now, if we had any other baddies in the baddie queue, at the beginning of the next round, they would come out. But since we don't, we don't have to worry about that. So the one other thing I want to cover now that we've gone through her uh, allocation of her different dice is that any dice that she rolls, she does not have to use. So say, for example, that she noticed that a baddie had a really bad effect if she wasn't able to kill it and she rolled poorly. She can choose to ignore those dice. Now, she's already spent her dexterity, so she won't regain that. And the same goes with skill dice. If, say, you roll a skill dice and you don't like the results of it, you can cancel that roll and put the skill dice back in your column and not gain its effects or uh, handle the effects. But again, you've used your dexterity. From there, there's a couple other things that she can do during her turn. Uh, she can spend uh, to do one backup plan. If she had any backup plan dice, she could choose one of the abilities that she has up to that number of dice, which right now she doesn't have any uh, backup plan dice, so she can't do that. And then we're ready to move on to the next person in sequence, which is going to be the, the orc. So the baddies work very similarly. First off, with the baddies, again, you would trigger any effects or any effect dice that are on their, their, their uh, chip. Then you're going to determine the baddies target. So the orc is a ranged combatant. And so, again, just like... Our boomer, he does not have to see his target, or he can target anybody on the anywhere on the board. And his target is going to be based on his targeting priority. So with the Orc Raider, his targeting priority is going to be the weakest gear lock on the board, which is the gear lock with the least number of hit points, which right now is Boomer. So he's going to go ahead and target her. From there, then you're going to resolve any skills that are on his his uh, chip, which the orc has rating. So if we check that on the uh, adventuring guide, rating is going to this unit gains one extra attack dice for every additional orc on the battle mat. So right now there are no other orcs, so he won't receive any additional dice. So he's going to roll one attack dice as he doesn't have any defensive dice listed. And let's see what he does. He rolls bones, so he doesn't have any skills that will trigger based on bones, so that is just a dud of a dice and will not do any damage to Boomer. And then from there, the last thing is that uh, if the if the gear lock that he targeted had any effects that are due from that targeting, then you would resolve those. Moving on, the next character we're going to look at is going to be Pickett. So Pickett is a melee character, so he's going to need to be adjacent to an enemy to target them. So he's already adjacent to our troll over here, so he can he doesn't need to move if he doesn't want to. So we don't he doesn't have any effect dice to handle, and he doesn't have any loot cards, so we're going to move right on to choosing a target. So we're going to go ahead and choose the troll. And again, each gear lock and enemy can only target one other character per turn, Unless some an effect or ability says otherwise. If a, a effect or like skill dice does not specify a target, then they can choose something else, another area or unit to target. But anything that says target on it must target the same individual, no matter if it's your attack dice, skill dice, or a backup plan. So from here, we're going to go ahead and target our troll here. And so Pickett has three dexterity, so he can choose up to three dice to roll. He has one attack dice that he can roll and two defense dice, but our defense dice are already locked in the active slots. So the one nice thing about this is you can discard any dice in the active slot at any time. So we're going to go ahead and take this one defense dice out and give it another roll so maybe we can get something else. All right, so we're going to go ahead and attack. All right, nice. So we got two defense, and we rolled two on our attack dice. So we're going to do two damage to him, but he does have thick skin, which is going to negate the first point of damage during the turn that he receives. So he's only going to take one point of damage instead. 
From there, then Pickett doesn't have any dice in his backup plan yet, so there's nothing else for him to do. And he does have one dexterity left, so he could choose to move at this point and move out of the way. But we're pretty happy with where he's at right now so that he can attack that next enemy or the other one as it moves in. And he has plenty of defense, so I'm not really too worried about him taking hits. So then we're going to move on to the next enemy, which is going to be our troll down here. So again, this is a melee troll, so it's going to move. And in, with uh, melee enemies, they're going to move towards the closest character that they can get to, not necessarily the one that's priority, unless they're tied for the same distance. In that situation, then they would move towards their targeting priority. So our troll is going to move two spaces, as that is the maximum movement they can move to get next to Pickett, and then he's going to make his attack roll. So, and again, like I said at the beginning of their turn, they would resolve any effect dice or anything, but he doesn't have anything on him. So then he's going to get one attack dice, and we're going to go ahead and give it a roll against Pickett. Oh, so he rolled a two on the damage, so he's going to do two damage to Pickett. So you always have to spend your defensive dice first before you take damage on your character. So we're going to lose two defense from that, and that is the troll's turn then and then we're going to move on to our final enemy which is the other troll that is already on picket so he's not going to need to move and he doesn't have anything to resolve on his uh, chip itself so then we're going to move right into combat he's going to receive one attack dice and one defensive dice we're going to go ahead and give those a roll and he rolls one attack and one defense. So the defensive dice is going to go right onto his chip and will help him in defense. And the attack dice will target Pickett again. Pickett has two defense, so he'll drop that down to one. And then we his turn is over. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that he had rolled bones instead. At that point, it's going to trigger his careless ability, which careless does the unit loses one HP. So in that situation, he would take one each another uh, token away from him and I from my interpretation of that he would lose the hit point even if his thick skin hadn't been triggered yet and it would bypass the defense as well because it's basically him being careless so it's not nothing's going to help him against his own stupidity all right so from here then we would resolve the end of the round if there was anything else to resolve and we would move into round two by flipping over the dice and continuing on from there so at this point i'm going to go ahead and bypass the rest of this and we're just going to go ahead and say that as you guys can see the comments going pretty well so we're just going to say that the gear locks had won so there's a couple of things i want to cover real quick obviously with uh, boomer she has her um different component dice that she's trying to make bombs with so she can always choose to roll those instead of rolling attack and defense dice to help accumulate those and as she does if she can get at least one component in each one she can trade those back down and receive one bomb that then she can use if she has any skill dice that require her to have bombs now the other things i want to cover is any dice that are in your active slot or backup plan at the end of combat, so once all of the combat is done, either the enemies win or the gear locks have won, the active dice and the backup plan dice will be removed from the gear lock. And the only dice that the gear lock can keep are the lock dice. Now, the one exception to this is that if a gear lock is killed. So if, say, Boomer had received enough hit points to knock her out, of the uh, combat and taking her away so we'll say that she lost all her hit points she would lose any of her active dice any of her lock dice and any of her backup plan dice those would go away for the rest of the round or until she comes back but she can she would not be able to interact with that combat in any way after that point so now i'm going to go through the rest of the phase so we move on to the reward phase where we're going to gain any loot or trove loot that we get which this particular event would provide us with a loot apiece, so each of our characters will take one loot card. So we have uh, a mech pick for Boomer, and we'll get uh, herbs for Pickett. From there, then, we can also spend any of our training points that we got. So again, this particular one, we got two more training points. So... Our gear locks can spend those, so Pickett's going to go ahead and go first. He's going to go ahead and gain uh, his stand ground skill, 
And we're also going to do, we're also going to bump up his dexterity by one more. From here, then we're going to go ahead and head over to Boomer, who can do some more stuff. So with Boomer, she's going to go ahead and get her frag dice. And let's see, let's go ahead and get, let's go ahead and get another dexterity for her as well. Oop, just one. All right. So then we're moving into the recovery phase. So again, we can trade loot with other party members if we want to. Neither one of our uh, gear locks has a uh, trove loot yet, so nobody can do lock picks. Then we can go down to our selection. So each gear lock will make one selection. So Pickett was took some damage, so he's going to go ahead and gain his health back up to his max health. So he lost a couple, so he's going to boost himself back up. And uh, Boomer here is going to, she's going to uh, go ahead and do a baddie selection. So let's go ahead and roll the dice, see what we get. So we can look at the top level one baddie. So it's a dragon hatchling. Eh, we've already fought one of those, don't really care for those. We're just going to place it on the bottom of that stack. All right. So then from here, we're ready to move into the next round. The one other thing, as you guys clear these encounters, it, when you're successful, they're also, most of them are going to be worth a encounter point, which obviously the overall goal is to get enough encounter points to equal your tyrant that you're going after. So you want to keep track of all those encounter points you have. So right now we've completed two encounters, and so we have two encounter points, and we need six before we can face... Uh, our tyrants for this game. Well, I hope you guys found that video helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching my videos. I do appreciate the fact that you take the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. It does really help me to stay motivated and to continue to bring these videos to you guys. And I'd also love to start a conversation with you guys, whether it's in the comment section below or over my Facebook and Twitter accounts. I'd love to know what you guys are playing or what you guys are interested in, how your guys' games are going, and if you guys back this one or have picked this one up, I'd love to know those thoughts as well, and what's your favorite gear lock and all those things. I'd love to start those conversations, so let me know, or games you guys want me to cover. I'm only one man, so I can only keep track of so much stuff. So if there's a game that's hot out there that you guys think I should be looking at, please leave those in the comments and let me know. All right, well, I will see you guys later.